We'll start. Uh, bonsoir, Jamian. Ahla wa sahla fikum. Shanvil alumni, ahla wa sahla fikum, Jamian. And we'd like to welcome also our dear friends. Behenne barat, Shanvil alumni, bas henne ashabna wa asdikana. So welcome to Allah Hedal webinar. Rahnut lubna Jamia to keep the speakers mute, please. Is there any question uh, uh, to type it on the chat box, please? وأكيد أول دير جاست سبيكر أند مودريتر رح بجاوبوكم عليها. شانفيل ألومناي بدهم 16500 أنسيان إيليف عم نقدر نشتغل هالفترة عم نعمل ويبينارز ديورينج ذيس بيريود أوكي بتعني الأشخاص وبتعني المجتمع اللبناني وعم نداول مواضيع اللي بتهمهم وعم نحضر لفاكسينيشن بروجيكت مع أغراض لكل الالومناي وبارون واتيديون انفون بروفيسور والمانجمنت تبع المدرسه هوبفلي بابريل بنكون بلشنا فيه وان شاء الله بعد اللوك داون وي كان ويلكم يو اول كنتو انسيان اليف شانفيل ولا امي دي انسيان اليف شانفيل بالكلب هاوس بشانفيل رح نقول ثانك يو للتوجيه اللي قدمت البلاتفورم اللي احنا عليها هلا عم نعمل هذا الويبينار والبارتنر مازن يشوع برومو 2008 Thank you to the coordinator of the Chambre de l'Alumna and the Yale Ash at Promo 2002. Thank you to the artwork that we did and we did sharing on social media, Promo 2002. We will send this webinar and it will be shared tomorrow on social media and on YouTube. And even the night we are live on Facebook. We will ask you to please, the ancient Chambre de l'Alumna, after not being able to send it, they will send it to the... الويب سايت تبع الانسيان شانفيل شانفيل الومناي دوت اورج راح موجود على تشات بوكس يو كان سي ات اند تو فولو بليز اور انستا بيج اند فيسبوك بيج شانفيل الومناي راح نقول ويلكم دير مودريتر رجا عبد الله بروموسيون 1984 رجا از بزنس كونسلتنت اند فاينانشال ادفايزر ويلكم دير جاست سبيكر زياد حايك بروموسيون 1976 انفستمنت بانكر ديفلوبمنت اكسبيرت Ex-Secretary General of the High Council of Privatization and PPP. Uh, Hisham Raghib, on behalf of uh, Chanville Alumni Committee, من Elkon, most welcome and enjoy this webinar. And we'll keep the floor to Raja Abdullah. Raja, please. Thank you, Hisham. Thank you so much. Great to see our school becoming more and more active at the alumni level. Really proud to belong to this institution especially in these difficult times where we need to create a, a real community. I'm Raja Abdullah. I'm a graduate of the college in 1984. It sounds like prehistory, but we're still around. We're, uh, we're still fighting and kicking in this country, trying to make things improve. Uh, I graduated in 84, started as an engineer, then as a banker, now as a consultant. Sometimes I wonder how that, did that happen, but it happened. Uh, I am a business consultant and both focus on finance. Um, however, the, the, the real star of the show today is my friend, my colleague, and my fellow alumni, uh, Ziad Hay. Uh, Ziad doesn't need much introduction. We know him all, uh, most recently as a Secretary General of the Higher Council for Privatization and PPP, El Khaskhasa. Uh, we're going to ask Siad in a while, where did we go with this project before we hit the real banking and financial topics? But Ziad is also uh, a very esteemed uh, uh, veteran banker and investment banker with some very big names such as Citibank, uh, Solomon Brothers, Bank and Suez, Bear Stearns. Uh, before he decided to uh, return to his native Lebanon in 2006 and take on the position of Secretary General as, uh, of the Higher Pri Council for Privatization. Ziad, great to have you. Uh, thank you for, for being here. Uh, we all have a bit of overload in the subject of what's happening in the banking sector today. Uh, we all are looking for clarity. Uh, we all are looking for some different and uh, fresh views on the sad state in which we find our banking sector today and the, uh, the general economy. But I would like to ask you 
before, uh, since you spent these 13 years at the High Council for Privatization, uh, what did we, uh, what did Lebanon gain through these years in terms of privatization potential? Uh, what happened? Uh, where are we headed? If we do get one day a government of technocrats uh, or specialists, like we hope, is this is privatization still uh, a key element for Lebanon's future? Uh, can we just say a few words on the future of privatization in Lebanon and the role it's likely to play in the next phase of Lebanon's economy whenever we get to that? Thank you, Raja. Uh, thank you very much, Hisham, for the invitation. Uh, like Raja, I'm very proud to be uh, a uh, Chanville alumnus. It has uh, always, um, you know, every time I have to give my CV anywhere, um, I uh, even though they usually look only for university uh, degrees in education, I always insist on putting Chanville because um, I'm very proud to have been a, a Chanville student. Um, especially, you know, when we get into talking about Jamhur and, and other, other schools like that, it makes me feel so good to be Chanville. <laughs> anyway, um, privatization. Uh, I, I'd like to say that since Lebanon was formed, or led to be, perhaps not to make any mistakes, since independence, Lebanon has never privatized anything. Um, not before me, not during the time that I was there, not since. So uh, Lebanon, uh, we like to talk a lot about being a free economy. In reality, we have nationalized many things. We nationalized electricity in the late 60s and early 70s. We uh, nationalized uh, telecommunications. We nationalized um, uh, water, we nationalized so many things, everything that was possible to nationalize, we have nationalized. Um, the, um, there hasn't been really a, any interest in privatizing. And the reason there's no interest in privatizing is mainly because of corruption. Um, it, people buy the story that that privatization, you know, if you privatize, it's the rich people or the hitan al mel that are also the politicians that are going to take over the, um, the uh, you know, the assets of the state. In reality, they have them. In reality, they control them. So the real reason they don't want to privatize is they don't want to give them away. It's not because they want to have them. It's because they don't want to give them away. They already have them. Um, if you look at um, who makes the decisions on all the non-privatized services, it's the politicians. Who appoints the boards of directors of these entities? It's the politicians. When, they, when we have the cellular networks, for example, the mobile networks are managed by private companies but in reality, these are fronts. The private companies managing the cellular networks are there with a management contract that's negotiated, renegotiated every year or every three years, depending on, on the term of the contract. And every time the contract is renegotiated, the minister gets to get a few freebies in order to sign the contract. The freebies are in the forms of uh, we ended up with, I think, about 800 more employees in our mobile networks than what we need. And uh, interesting story, I tell you, there was one minister that, you know, was always talking about, um, about um, implementing the telecoms law. So we have, a, we have a law for telecommunications that has been on the books since 2002. And it calls for privatizing the telecom sector and creating a company called Liban Telecom. So this minister was always talking about, you know, the need to implement that, that piece of legislation. And then he became minister of telecommunications. 
So I was very happy. I went to see him and I said, Mr. Minister, I'm so happy that, you know, you've uh, taken on this, uh, this ministry and now it's time uh, to do this, that, because, you know, your, your predecessor has, has uh, hired 400 more people than, than are needed and they are not even working there. And to his credit, that minister told me, look, Ziad, I've been in this business for a very long time, so I'm not going to lay anybody off. I'm going to hire some people myself. Um, so, and that's what happened. And he hired about 300 people. So um, there has, um, you know, the, the thing is that the propaganda of the politicians has worked so well and has been bought by the leftist leaning uh, parts of our society that, um, you know, every time the subject comes up, it's like, uh, I say, you know, does any one of us really feel like they're owners of EDL? Are we the proud owners of EDL? Are we the proud owners of, you know, do we get to say anything about other activities that we have? No, really. We own, we owe, we own these assets as people, as Lebanese. By, we, I mean, that's just uh, shar. Yeah, it's, it's poetry. It's not. It's not reality. And is anybody happy with the service, with any service that the government is giving them? Is anybody happy with, with water? Is anybody happy with electricity? Is anybody happy with telecoms? Is anybody happy with? Um, you know, with, with transport? Are we happy with the state of our, of our roads? Are we happy with the state of anything, any service that the government gives us? And the answer is no. So people are not happy with the services. And yet when you tell them you want to privatize, they're like, oh, no, 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 don't privatize. So I'm sorry for the lengthy answer, Raja, but um, that's reality. But is it part of the, uh, is there a role for that in the future? at least now that we're in such a dire situation with regard to, to the national debt? Is it something that is still spoken about? The said the conference is betting on some privatization. Is this still in the cards? Do you still see something happening if we do get a corruption-free government? And that's a big if. Of course, I mean, I think uh, privatization has to play a role in advancing our economy. Um, if nothing else, and I, I'll come back to that, but just I just want to point out that SEDR actually is not related to privatization, just uh, to be clear. SEDR has some, a small PPP component, small public-private partnership component, uh, but mainly SEDR is really money to the government, uh, to government projects. Um, but um, regarding, uh, regarding the... Um, um, you know the uh, whether whether privatization can play a role in the future the answer is yes because we have to improve our infrastructure we have to improve our services we cannot hope to grow our economy uh, without infrastructure and um, and there are two two conditions to growing our infrastructure one is privatizing what's already in the hands of the government and the other is building new infrastructure, which is where public-private partnership comes in. There has been, when we went to the SEDR conference, and this is where I maybe I make the link with PPP uh, and SEDR. When we went to the SEDR conference, um, I remember that in that big meeting in Paris, every representative of every government that spoke and every institution, international financial institution that spoke, they all congratulated Lebanon on enacting PPP legislation. That's, a, 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 that's a, the PPP law, which I lobbied for for 10 years. And eventually, with the help of some very well-meaning members of parliament, um, we were able to pass. And I, I can talk about that later on. Um, that was the only achievement that we bragged about at SEDR. 
everything else was was a promise. We we promised to bring down the deficit. We promised to um, to uh, uh, you know stabilize uh, the economy and and do this and that. And yet, when we came back from said the first meeting of the Council of Ministers, after that they um, they decided to give the Deir Amar power plant. Um, uh, to Ala Al Khawaja and his partners, which is like a no no. I mean, the whole PPP legislation is about transparency, is about proper procurement uh, processes. Um, and uh, Pierre Duquesne, who was the, um, the uh, representative uh, or the uh, envoy of Macron for said, uh, called me and he said, uh, you know, Mais que font vos, vos politiciens? Qu'est-ce qui se passe? Euh, vous venez de nous dire que, que, vous, que, vous, aviez, euh, que vous alliez travailler, euh, euh, faire les, les partenariats publics privés comme il faut. Vous avez la loi, tout ça. Je veux dire, what, what can you say? Écoutez, monsieur l'ambassadeur, les choses vont changer. On va avoir des élections, ça va être mieux. Attendez. Nine months later, they form a government. What does the government do? The first thing they want to do is they want to pass legislation that says the Minister of Energy can basically give contracts for uh, award contracts for building power plants, etc., without even being subject to the law of uh, public accounting. Anun uh, al mm -hmm. which was unbelievable. I mean, imagine that you are saying to a minister, you have carte blanche, go and do whatever you want. And what was even more amazing is that parliament voted that law and it became law. And fortunately, some, uh, some members of parliament, I think there were 10 of them, Tano Behed al Anun, and Al Majlis al Dusturi Aptal Jhayda Jazak Minno, and Al Wazir Minno Khadi Ala Anun Muhasab al Umumi. So, but um, you know that's that's when uh, I decided it was I was wasting my time. I mean, it was impossible. There's 11.8 billion dollars waiting to come to Lebanon to be invested in our infrastructure, and what do we do? We blow it all away by making such decisions that really only serve the corrupt interests of our politicians. That's sorry, sad sorry indeed. But uh, okay, we won't dwell too much on that, Ziad. Thank you for uh, for this point. Let's get into the uh, the real subject tonight, uh, which is the banking crisis. Okay, uh, you authored a paper with Jaha Charvet entitled "Proposal to Help Lebanon Overcome Its Financial Crisis." I know you've uh, presented it to the Central Bank of Lebanon as a counter proposal to what the government had on its mind and what the Association of Banks came up with uh, as a counter proposal to that. So I want to, uh, I will be asking you specific questions about this plan as we as we progress uh, this evening. I just want to ask you to give us the flavor of this plan and how is it different uh, from the government's plan and from the Association of Banks plan in terms of rescuing uh, our banks, rescuing our banking system. Okay, well, I mean, the government's plan um, basically dealt with the debt situation. They said, you know, the debt is too large, we cannot pay it off. Um, so we have to do a haircut on the euro bonds, we have to do a haircut on, on the government debt and, and the... Um, and the... Um, the, the lollers are no longer there, so they disappear. So the banking system has to, uh, you know, the, the banks are bankrupt. I, it's not, what I'm going to say is not exactly correct, but just to... Uh, uh, please, could, uh, Hisham, can you mute everyone? Can you, uh, or is this something I can do from here? Yes, we're doing, we're doing this. Okay, sorry for that. Um, Ziad, go ahead. So it's, what I'm going to say is not exactly accurate, but it just gives the flavor. So the government's 
the government's plan deals with the balance sheet. I mean, many of you are business people and you understand the financial accounting. So the, the government's plan deals with the balance sheet, the assets and liabilities. The bank's plan deals with the cash flow statement. So basically the banks are saying, uh, look, the maturities uh, that are owed to us by the central bank, those CDs haven't come to maturity yet. So, so the central bank is not bankrupt. I mean, they, uh, they're, they're, there's no default. And, and we are not bankrupt, uh, you know, we haven't uh, defaulted. And uh, so in essence, basically we can still be going concerns. It's just that what we need is for the government to make sure that the government is going to pay us and then we can pay the depositors. And so to make sure that the government is going to pay us, we want $40 billion worth of, of the assets of the government to be placed under the tutelage of the central bank so that we make sure that there is that there is money there. So the government is talking about the balance sheet. The banks are talking about the cash flow statement, but nobody really is dealing with the income statement, which is where the profit and loss is. And that's where there's disagreement, as you hear a lot, you know, Dale uh, Chaseyer. And um, so it was important that what Gerard Charvé and I did, uh, our plan um, is basically deals with the balance sheet, the income statement and the cash flow statement. It deals with the debt, it deals with the losses and it deals with the liquidity. Um, I, I still think it is the best plan, um, obviously, uh, you know, I haven't seen anything better. Uh, there are other ideas about like creating a good bank, bad bank type setup, which really works well in, but but it works well within a one economy that where you have everything is going well. It's just this one institution that you need to deal with. You you divide it into a good bank and bad bank. But you know to divide our entire economy, our entire banking system into good bank and bad bank with three currencies in effect that we have, Lebanese pound and dollar and dollar, I, I think it is, it is uh, not the right approach. Now, um, I said that, um, I, I should say, I mean, people are probably saying, yeah, but you know, who are you to say this? And I don't want to talk about myself necessarily, but just to, just to establish credibility I'd like you to know that Gerard Charvet is the guy that invented the concept of the Brady Bond, uh, which is the uh, financial instrument that saved Latin America in the 1980s. And I worked on, on that when I was at Citibank. Um, and, and later on, I was advisor to the Mexican government on the peso crisis. And uh, I restructured the debt of Venezuela, Trinidad, Tobago, and Honduras. So Gerard and I, we have some experience in dealing with these kinds of situations, while nobody in Lebanon really has dealt with it other than us. Nobody, not, not in government, not the advisors of the ministers or the politicians. So everybody is improvising and it is very unfortunate. Now, if you allow me to say how, what is the plan based on? The plan is based on number one, um, doing a, a haircut on the euro bonds, uh, you know, that's, but then the rest of the debt is in Lebanese pounds and with the devaluation of the Lebanese pound, that debt is worth a lot less. And also there's other accounting uh, mechanism. Well, actually, if I, if I can share a slide, I can show you, but I don't want, I don't know if you want me to go through that right now. Well, I'll be asking you specific questions on the various elements of the plans yet. So maybe we'll, we'll, we'll come to that in a while. So what does your, where does your plan see the, uh, the, the real size of the banking loss, we, losses? We know the government had an estimate which was uh, argued downwards by the banks themselves. There was a very long disagreement, uh, advisors quitting the, uh, the negotiating team with the IMF. Uh, where do banks stand in terms of their loss today? What do you think is the actual loss in the banking system, including the central bank? And the big question, are our banks 
bankrupt today? Are they really uh, just standing there because there's a service to be given, but in reality, are they bankrupt? Um, look, for the losses, I'm of, I'm of the following opinion. I think it's useless, it's counterproductive to argue that the losses are less than what somebody else says they are. I mean, let's assume the worst case scenario. I'm happy to take what the government said the losses are, which is the banks say, oh, it's too much. I'm happy to, add, to say, look, the losses are $76 billion. Why, why, who am I, you know, who am I arguing with? I mean, I'm saying, no, I'm not going to lose this. I'm saying, I'm not going to lose this. I'm going to see if I can deal with that much loss, then that's great. And you know, anything less than that will be icing on the cake. If I build my plan to deal with the worst case scenario, then I will be, you know, I will be more comfortable than building a small plan. Why 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 are you gonna do that? So uh, now are the banks bankrupt? Yes, technically, I mean, if you uh, want to consider, you know, if you want to apply Basel uh, requirements and if you want to apply IFRS 9 and all the other requirements for good, um, good financial accounting, et cetera, they are technically bankrupt. Does that mean that they don't have liquidity today? Um, they don't have liquidity if everybody wants their deposits back. So what they're doing is they're not giving people their deposits back. They're um, and uh, I mean the 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 I subscribe to the opinion that we're, we have a mafia and militia governing the country. And uh, on the one hand, and we have the populist uprising on the other, and the populist uprising is not smart about the economy or finances, it's just populist. So, so uh, right now we are stuck between, between those two. On the government side, the, we've had a year and a half now of financial crisis. The government has taken only one decision, and that is not to pay the euro bonds. And they haven't taken any other decision. And that was the worst decision they could have taken because you know they, they effectively declared the bankruptcy of the country at a time when they really didn't need to do that. And I, I know many people disagree with that, so I, I'm happy to, to address it later on as to why I think that way. So the government hasn't done anything. Parliament hasn't done anything. They've, everybody's been asking them for a law on capital controls. They haven't done it. Uh, they met and they approved. I mean, they approved a project to build a tunnel from Beirut to the Beka. I mean, we have a financial crisis. We're in the middle of a financial crisis and our parliament meets and discusses building a tunnel from Beirut to the Beka. You know, what are they talking about? I mean, what have they been smoking? I don't know. So it is, it is very, very frustrating. The other side of the coin is, is people in the street and they are, you know, Baddon Ras Riyad Saleme, Baddon Ras Al Masarif, Kaza Kaza. Okay, I, I do understand the anger. Of course, they're right to be angry. But at the same time, you know, what good does it do anybody to bankrupt the banking system? It's just like, it's our money in there. It's everybody's money. You know, you bankrupt the banking system. It's not that, you know, you, you take it out on the shareholders and they lose their, their equity. You know, they, basically they know they lost it. That's not the point. Um, you, you bankrupt the banking system and you lose all the deposits. That's the real tremendous haircut. So in, in the middle, what's happening is inertia. Nothing is doing and nobody's doing anything. And people are losing, as we all know, we're losing the value of our deposits little by little with this uh, system that they have. The central bank is taking decisions that are haphazard. 
uh, that are, don't drive, there's no strategy at the end of the day. Uh, they cannot implement a strategy. And, and this is important for people to understand because many people blame the central bank for not having a strategy. The central bank is not able to put together a strategy for the country. It is the government that has to do it. The central bank can then manage the monetary effect of that one way or another and help deal with it. But if the main problem is not the central bank, the main problem is the politicians. Unfortunately, that's that's so true. Uh, okay, so yeah, before we speak of deposits, because deposits is on everybody's mind, and we would like to know how your plan addresses that. What happens then to the euro bond holders since since Lebanon has officially defaulted? Where uh, how, how much are we likely to recover for euro bond holders once the the dust settles? Look, the euro bonds are trading at uh, at a deep discount and. Um, in the plan that Gerard Charvet and I put together, we, uh, we were very kind to the Eurobond holders and assumed only a 50% haircut. Um, a 50% haircut is basically uh, lets the people that bought at a discount, the arbitrageurs, lets them make money. Um, and that is on purpose. It's so that they don't oppose that, so that we don't spend years in courts you know, you, you basically have to settle. It's just like any, any legal proceeding. This is, so you have to pay a little bit to, to settle. Um, the central bank and, you know, has talked about a 75% haircut. So basically paying 25 cents on the dollar. I say that's, that's fine. I mean, if you can do that, great, uh, do it. Uh, but I'm not going to build the plan that assumes that because if I, again, for the same reason, I have to take the worst case scenario. Nobody's expecting that more than 50% of the euro bond uh, pay, principle would be paid at this stage. All right. By the and way, let me, let me make the following uh, remark. Sure. Today, the debt of the euro bonds have become the largest indebtedness of the Lebanese government in dollar terms. So we used to have $30 million of euro bonds and $98, million, $98 billion of Lebanese lira. The $98 billion of Lebanese lira are now worth 10 billion. And, and the euro bonds are 30 billion with a haircut at you know 50%, they're worth 15 or 30% haircut, they're worth 10. Worth 10. So, so basically uh, it's amazing. And, this is what many people don't realize. It's one way for governments to get out of the uh, high indebtedness that they have is to devalue. And that's, you know, that's what happened. That's what's happening. Okay, so we get to the big question now Every, on everybody's mind. How does your plan address the fate of people's deposits in the bank, which are trapped and there seems to be no visibility as to how are people going to ever get their money back in the banks. So how does your plan address that versus the government's plan or the Lazar plan and the plan of the association of, of banks? Can we talk of deposits? Okay, the, the government's plan says those deposits are no longer there. The, the lollers were fictitious, so they're no longer there. Uh, you lost them. Um, the first loss will be taken by the shareholders of the banks. And then you depositors, basically, will, you will do a bail-in and you will, um, you, you will become the, effectively the shareholders of these banks. Of course, uh, your $100 deposit is now worth a lot less and you don't have the $100. Actually, you have you know, the equivalent of $1 maybe in equity. Um, of course, to, to, to lubricate, I'm sorry for the word maybe, that, that, uh, uh, that awful, awful, awful medicine that's been given. That's right. They said, yeah, but you know, actually what we're going to do, we're going to do two other things. We're going to create a, uh, a uh, public asset holding company. And, you know, maybe in the future, we will privatize something and maybe we'll be able to pay you a little bit out of that. And we are going to go after the people 
you know, the bad people that uh, transferred their money abroad. Uh, we're going to get that money back. And we're going to go after the politicians who stole the money and we're going to get that money back. Reality is, you know, it will take decades before you can get the politicians money back. Um, it is the people that transferred their money since there was no there were no laws that prohibited this. You cannot win any court case against them by saying you transferred money. Yes, maybe they were not totally patriotic, but you know, you're not going to win that case. It was not and illegal. It was not illegal. And so therefore, uh, these are empty promises that the government plan had. The bankers plan uh, says, no, no, um, you know, the, the lollers are still there, your, your deposits are there. And but what, what they don't come out and say very clearly, but but this is a, what it is, they say, we're going to pay you in Lebanese pounds. And we're going to pay you in Lebanese pounds at the rate that we decide, which they decided currently for it to be 3,900. And they can continue to do that. So the banks are saying, we're doing just fine right now. Let us continue to do what we're doing. In, in our plan, um, we transfer those deposits, those Lawler deposits, into CDs, into tradable CDs. So you have $100 at the bank. You, the bank has to issue you a piece of paper that says, um, you know, I, the bank, owe you $100. And this is a tradable instrument that you can take and you can sell uh, to somebody. Now, you say, OK, but I sell. You know who's going to buy it? People are going to buy it at a deep discount. Yes, today they will buy it at a deep discount if you really want to get out very quickly. But at least you can get your money. I mean, it, at least it's better than getting two thousand dollars a month at three thousand nine hundred. Um, with time, with time, that CD may have more value, and you will be able to get more out of it. What's important with this plan is not only that you create liquidity, that people can access their money again. What's important is that you create capital markets in Lebanon. So in Lebanon, for decades, I mean, maybe al almost since the 60s at least, uh, the only thing you could invest in was either real estate or you put your money in the bank. There was no other investment. You can't do futures, you can't do options, you can't trade equities, really. You can't, I mean, no structured products. Okay, if you're rich and you have a private bank account and you get your banker to do some equity trading for you with their offshore account or something, yes, but not for the normal Lebanese. And this has been, you know, disastrous because you ended up putting your money in the bank and the banks had no you know, couldn't do anything with this money other than compete to keep staying afloat. And so they, they paid you more and more to take your money. And the only thing they did with it was lending it to the government. And, um, and the real estate markets were inflated and everybody, you know, our green mountains became uh, cement blocks uh, because everybody wanted to build. I mean, and there are so many empty buildings and so many buildings that are not even finished. Uh, so um, this type of investment has been disastrous. The, the government's plan says all the banks are bankrupt. And what we're going to do is we're going to create five new banks. So basically, <clears throat> it is perpetuating the current system that we have. And of course, the banker's plan also perpetuates the current system. Um, not only that, but the government's plan, and this has been the government's policy in Paris 3, in Cedre, and every other, and even in the last, in their, in their, uh, in their most recent plan, uh, their plan for, for the capital markets is as follows. We are going to privatize the Beirut Stock Exchange and we're going to create an electronic trading platform. I say, what do you do? You know, what, what does it mean? Uh, privatizing the Beirut Stock Exchange? Okay, now it's under new management. 
Okay, fine, nothing changed. And I'm going to create an electronic trading platform. This used to sound very futuristic and very, you know, nowadays, an electronic trading platform is not even a website. I mean, today websites, you can trade anything online and you have a much better technology than any technology that the, you know, the, the Bourse of Beirut is going to be able to create. So, so you, have, you have a new management and you have a website. Great, but where's, where's the product? What are you buying and selling? Well, we have nothing. We have Solidaire shares. Solidaire shares and Biblos and Blom. You know, I mean. There was a plan to introduce something for SMEs, smaller companies. That was. Uh, I but still, I mean, SMEs is, is not a solution, right? SMEs is not a solution because any stock market, any capital market to be successful needs to have two, um, or let me say maybe, okay, there are three main things. One is proper legislation, proper framework, etc. But there are two main financial aspects that, that are needed. One is liquidity and one is volume. If you don't have volume and liquidity, your financial market is, you know, is useless. And the only way to get volume and liquidity is to have large amounts of product. And this is what our plan creates. It's $70 billion worth of CDs of various maturities issued by various banks that really $70 billion. Now you can say we have, you know, deep capital markets. So, so, so yeah. no, no, go ahead. Finish your sentence, I'm sorry, yeah. No, I, I just wanted to say that would be, that would be our proposed alternative is to change our banking system uh, and, and, and develop a new financial system for Lebanon based on banking and capital markets. So people's deposits will effectively become uh, tradable instruments on an organized market. That's right. And if we have to, in a nutshell, tell people, can, can you translate that into a time frame whereby people could recover 100%, 90%, 80%, whatever of the deposits? Can it be measured in the number of years? Can we tell the average depositor it's going to take five years, 10 years or longer to recover your deposit as it stood before October 2019, according to your plan? Well, that's, uh, I mean, that's a very tough condition. Uh, recuperate 100% of it. Um, and then, you know, there's a question mark, is it 100% plus interest or is it 100% of the principal or... But, uh, but I think that uh, the answer to that is, is very difficult. You need at least 10 years to get that. And some of the CDs we're, we're proposing to issue are five-year CDs and other are, others are 10-year CDs. And the 10-year CDs have a feature which is they're convertible into the shares of the privatized companies, the companies to be privatized in the future so that there might be an earlier exit. So maybe you don't have to wait 10 years to recoup 100% of your, of your principal. Maybe you can recoup that within five, six, seven years, you know, whenever there's proper privatization being done. And what's going to drive the value of these certificate of deposits? What's, what's going to determine the day-to-day -day value on this, uh, on this market? Um, the day-to-day -day value on uh, on market is going to be basically what's going to drive it is is the interest rate, the discount rate, if you like, on the on the CD. So you're buying it at uh, less than face value. You're buying it at a discount. If you are, if you're a rich person, and you, um, I mean, this is this is how all trading is done, right? I mean. Uh, uh, these CDs we propose pay um, a small interest. We're proposing like treasuries, 10 year treasuries plus 2% or something like this. So, um, so they will trade that at discount. That discount will reduce with time and, and people will buy it now. Let's say I buy a CD today at a 50% discount. If I hold it to maturity, I will make a, I will receive $100, but maybe I will not hold it to maturity. I will buy it at 50% discount 
and I will sell it tomorrow to somebody else at 45% discount, I'll make $5 on it. Understood. Okay, let's move on to the subject of the uh, exchange rate. The, that's another subject on everybody's mind. We, we know that we're hitting new records uh, every day. We're hitting record as we speak. What does your plan foresee for the exchange rate system? Of course, I'm not asking you to forecast where can the exchange rate go. There have been wild forecasts reaching unimaginable uh, ceilings. This is not my question. What is the right exchange rate system uh, for Lebanon? And uh, how likely are we to have a change in this official rate or a change in the system within uh, 2021? Uh, the second part of the question is difficult for me to answer because I don't know. Um, it depends on so many things. It depends on whether we have a government, whether they come up with a strategy, whether they, uh, I mean, political situation, then you're getting into the, the politics of it. But um, what I can, as a good doctor, I can give the, the uh, prescription, uh, whether, the, whether the patient actually takes the medicine or not, I don't know. Okay. But uh, prescription is, uh, is for a unified exchange rate, uh, for a free floating exchange rate, at least for a period of time. Um, in order to establish the, the true value of the Lebanese pound. And we're proposing maybe like three to six months of a free float. Once you have the market determining the value of the Lebanese pound, then we recommend the crawling peg. And I will explain, I will explain all this. Um, many people are worried about the, the central bank printing money. And they say, if the central bank prints money, that's going to drive inflation. That's true. You know, it will drive inflation. But would you rather have inflation or would you rather have hyperinflation? And the, the multiple exchange rate system does not only create inflation, it creates hyperinflation. Because I'll give a simple example. If you're a store owner, shopkeeper, and you have a jar of anything, Nutella, and you know, you're, what, what price do you sell the Nutella at in Lebanese pounds? Are you going to sell it? You know that it costs about, let's say, $4. Uh, what does $4 mean in Lebanese pounds? Are you going to translate it at $1,500? at 3,900, at 6,000, at 10,000, at what? And, and so, because you know you're going to have to replace that jar once you sell it, the natural thing for you to do is to assume the worst case scenario. So when the price of the Lebanese pound in the black market was at 5,000, still the stores were pricing their goods at 10,000 because they expected the Lebanese pound to get to 10,000. And so that is the process that drives hyperinflation. The, the black market rate is a rate for a very small amount of dollars and Lebanese pounds being exchanged. And that is a market with no volume and no depth. And so if you let that market determine, dictate what the value in the minds of people is for the entire economy, you're driving hyperinflation. Mm -hmm. And every country that has done multiple exchange rates has ended up with huge problems. It's, and I understand, I understand the psychology. The psychology is, oh my God, you know, I cannot take that. This will be, well, this will be disastrous. So I, I want to have what's called a soft landing. I'm going to land this thing little by little. But guess what? That soft landing that you do is only, is only prolonging the agony. It's only making everybody suffer for that much longer and is creating hyperinflation. It's much better to take the medicine and, and deal with it today and create what's called a V-shaped recovery. 
So the government's plan and you know the central bank, what they're doing is in their mind, they're trying to create a U-shaped recovery. So it goes like this, right? It's like a Nike logo. Um, and the idea is to create, better idea is to create a V-shaped recovery. Go down, you know, and, just and then- get, just, just get it over with and, and, and bounce back up uh, exactly. again. So uh, we're currently in a hyperinflation mode. We know that we're making history around the world for being an hyperinflationary uh, country. Uh, as, the, as the country unpegs the currency and lets it float the way you just described it, where do we go to with inflation? What, what do, where do we hit? What's the next, uh, the next target for inflation? Okay, so what we're, what we're talking about is only a float for a short period of time. Now, normally, you would say in other countries, you would have a permanently floating exchange rate. Um, and why are we talking about a crawling peg? What's a crawling peg? Um, you, have, you have that uh, range. Let's say before it used to be 1,400, I don't know what, 70 or something like this to 1,515 or what, something like that. Um, and it, that was the range that the Lebanese pound was, was floating within. A crawling peg is like that, but then it moves. So it can move up or it can move down. It's that same thing. And the reason you have that is because the Lebanese pound is very a liquid currency. Uh, it doesn't have depth. We are a small country with a small economy. Um, and you don't want in a purely floating exchange rate environment, if somebody wants to import a big machine, somebody wants to build a, I don't know, a cardboard plant in Lebanon and is going to import a machine that's, that's worth you know, $25 million, all of a sudden they go, they buy $25 million on, on, the, on the market and it will move the exchange rate. And you don't want that to happen. Maybe I'm exaggerating, you don't, uh, you know, maybe larger numbers but um, it will move the exchange rate and you don't want that to happen. So you want to be able to smooth this over time, but still not have, have a system that's going to bend, not a system that's going to break. I understand, thank you. Uh, quick word on gold reserves, uh, Ziad. Does your plan address the fate of Lebanon's gold reserves? What happens to that? We all speak about it, but doesn't seem to figure uh, in any plan uh, concretely. What's your view on that? And how does your plan use these gold reserves uh, uh, constructively? Um, thank you. That's a very, very good question. Thank you for asking. it. It's very important. Yes, it, it uses the gold reserves. Um, look, there is there's something that has been built. It's like, this is like in the, in the, in our national mythology that uh, in our national mythology, uh, privatization is bad, and the gold is should we should keep it there. It's you know this belongs to the Lebanese people, and the gold is uh, backing the Lebanese pound. I mean, we we have the gold, and the gold has been going up in value, and still the Lebanese pound has been going down in value. So anybody that says that the, the gold is protecting the value of the Lebanese pound, you know, they don't know what they're saying because really there's a, the, Le, the Lebanese pound is not backed by gold. I mean, no currency today is backed by gold. And so really it's only the fiat of the government. Um, so, okay, so the gold is not there to back the Lebanese pound, but it is there to back the economy uh, in difficult times. Okay, so I, I guess we're living in, in very good times now because obviously we don't need the gold because of course not. We're living, I mean, if we have a gold reserve, it is for something, it's not for us to pray for it. You know, it's not and you know, we have the gold to be used for something and to be used in, in difficult times. These are difficult times. Let me ask you this. If we have the gold reserves, let's say we're at $16 billion and with the increase in the price of gold, maybe now it has come down again, but at that time, you know, went up to $18 billion. So we made $2 billion, okay, just, just 
you know, by doing nothing. It's just the market driving up. Then we had the Beirut explosion and we had all these people that became homeless and we have that misery. And, you know, instead of saying, look, I, I just, you know, I have $2 billion. I just made $2 billion. Let me take this and at least, you know, pump it in, have a program, you know, all of a sudden bring Beirut back up, help people up. No, the government didn't do anything, you know, because they cannot touch the gold because Dahab Mu'ad does and let people suffer. Let uh, Farah al Ata and solidarity and, you know, I don't know what, uh, al Baraka and everybody else, uh, Arc-en-Ciel, run around and try to get money. Uh, to, to, to rebuild Beirut, and the government is sitting there, you know, and they don't do anything. So this, these are the politicians. And on the other side, you have the populists, you have the people on the street. You know, it's like, it reminds me of an uncle of mine that uh, spent his life, you know, in, in, a, in a store, because um, you know he was worried about expansion. It's like as a as a فتح غير مطرح ما بأمن لحد على الصندوق بسرو بسرو المصريات بدي أقعد أنا ورا الصندوق. Okay, okay, تقعد أنت ورا الصندوق, but you'll never have a supermarket. You'll never have other branches because you have not accepted in your mind that you can have a proper governance system, that you can have proper controls. Get the gold use the gold don't give it to the politicians there are many ways of dealing with governance there are many ways of dealing with with transparency insist on transparency but don't just give up okay Sorry, I get emotional about it. It is an emotional subject. We uh, we are all emotional about it. For the sake of time, I'll just ask one more question, Ziad. So now with banks being largely out of action, large banks are not lending, uh, and we know it's probably going to be a while before they do again. Uh, who's going to who's gonna support the, 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 the economy? Who's going to... Uh, what future do we have for our... Uh, small businesses, family businesses who require uh, money to, to get over the stage and, and survive, who's gonna, uh, who's gonna cater to them, the financial markets and the financial system, now that banks are, as you said, technically bankrupt? What's gonna happen to these companies that require funding? In our plan, the banks don't go bankrupt. In our plans, the, the banks, uh, I mean, uh, technically, they don't go bankrupt. So, uh, so we don't get the shareholders, we don't kick the shareholders out, we keep the shareholders. We know that they, are, they have to assume their responsibility, they have to lose their capital. But instead of wiping out their capital on day one, like the government says, we wipe out their capital over a period of seven years. So they have to recapitalize the banks and, and, uh, and assume the losses over a period of, on average, seven years. Um, so the banking system continues to function, and this is very essential. I mean, for those among us that are not economists, I, I will say the following. You know, banks play a crucial role in an economy. They create the multiplier effect. What does the multiplier effect mean? It means if I have a dollar, I have a piece of paper, it's a dollar. I just have, a, the economy has only one dollar. If I take that dollar, and I put it in the bank, then I still have a dollar and the bank now has a dollar. We've created two dollars. The bank takes that dollar and lends it to a third person for a businessman, SME or whatever. And that person now has the dollar. So we have three dollars. And this guy gives terms of payment to his customers. You pay me after 60 days or something. The customer has a dollar. So we have the dollar becomes four dollars when you have a banking system. You cannot bankrupt the banking system, bankrupt the banks, and and hope for the economy to grow or SMEs to find financing or anything like that. So you keep the banks. You use the gold. This is where you use the gold. This is where, in our plan, 
you we're not selling the gold. Uh, you can sell it. I have nothing against selling it, but to soften the blow so that people can be more accepting of it, we're saying borrow against the gold. So you borrow against the gold. That liquidity is then pumped into the system. That's about ten billion dollars worth of liquidity coming into the system, and then because of the devaluation of the Lebanese pound, and because then many people are going to eventually, when they get those CDs, they're going to transfer those CDs from dollars into Lebanese pounds so they can live and pay with. And, and uh, um, so you're reducing that, um, you're creating liquidity by pumping in Lebanese pounds. So in these two actions, you basically bring back the economy to life. And it doesn't take very long, actually. If you take these decisions very quickly uh, within you know, you can start feeling the effect within six months. So you see that banks will resume their role of lending within a reasonable time frame, according to your plan. That they will. According to our plan, yes. According to what's happening now, I yeah, think. It's, uh, no, it's more of the same. They're just gonna continue to do this until somebody stops them. Ziad, yeah, thank you very much. I will stop my uh, questions at this point. I would like to take uh, questions from the. Uh, um, participants. There are some questions which are in the chat box, which I'll read to you. And after that, if people will use the process of raising their hands so that we can uh, go uh, in terms of, of, of precedence or, or priority. So we have one question. How do you see the future of banks in Lebanon? Well, we've addressed that, but would you like just to add a very quick word in your plan? Are the banks still around? Are some banks still around? Are all banks still around? What are, what's your take on that? Some banks will be still around. Um, you know, uh, I, I, know, I know at least, I know one banker that says that we don't have enough banks, we need more banks. I certainly don't agree with that. Um, I definitely think that we need less banks. Uh, I think there needs to be consolidation. I think that we need to have consolidation some banks will survive, others will not. Okay, another question is, what's your opinion on having three different uh, US dollar Lebanese pound rates? Of course, you said that you would like to see a, a harmonization or a unification because this is creating the utmost uh, confusion. Uh, is, this, is, this, is this your answer? That we have yeah. to go to a unified rate to a floating rate yeah, is just it a managed floating. rate? Is it a managed floating rate, or you just let in your plan it just goes to whatever limit it has to go, according to, to the whatever limit it has to go within the three or six months until you establish a real value for it, and then and then you implement a crawling peg mechanism. And do we have any studies that say, economically speaking, with the the, the balance of payments the way it is or it was before October two thousand nineteen, what should the real rate of exchange B, do we have any serious studies on that? Did the Lazar plan address this? No, I mean, the Lazar plan used the rate of 3,500 at the time. Our plan used the rate of 3,200 at the time. Obviously, I mean, where is the real value? Uh, you know, this is a moving target, actually. Um, most, uh, what I can say is the real value today is less than 10,000 something. Because why do I say that? Because that's the rate that's at the black market at the, at the very last margin of the market where there's very little liquidity. So by definition, in, in theory anyway, it is less than, less than 1,000. Okay. Uh, let me see what other questions. If you were in government today, what would your strategy be? Well, I think this is you would like to implement your plan, the plan you have co-authored with, uh, with Gérard uh, Charvet. Uh, what's the difference between your plan and the current checks trading market? I'm not sure what current checks mean, but I think the fact that you can today, there are dollars in checks, there are do real dollars, and then there are Lebanese pounds. And even there, there is a a discount between cash Lebanese pounds and, and check Lebanese pounds. So does, does your plan still see a market between real dollars and dollars and real Lebanese pounds cash and, and, and Lebanese pounds in the bank? Well, you eliminate the concept of, of dollar 
um, you end up with an organized concept of the check. So today you have these checks and the check is really, I mean, the CD that I'm talking about in essence is like a check because the, the government, the, the bank is telling you, you know, here you have this paper, it represents a hundred dollars and then you can go and get for a discount today to somebody. And the problem with that is um, it is not organized. There is no depth of market. There's no liquidity. There's no uh, price setting mechanism. So it's haphazard. It's one guy has a, has a check for a small amount. The other guy has a check for a large amount. Um, there's no, excuse me, there's no maturity for these checks. So whoever is buying that check from you does not know when exactly the bank is supposed to pay him and how is the bank going to be able to pay him? Therefore, these checks are trading at a deep discount and deeper, much deeper than what the CDs would trade at. Okay, we have a question from uh, an alumnus 1984, uh, Jean-Claude Chedia, my good friend who is now living in, in, in Montreal. And maybe Jean-Claude, I'll let you ask the question because you've raised your hand also regarding the CDs. Go ahead, Jean-Claude. Yes. Uh, hi, uh, Mr. Hayek. Um, regarding the, F, uh, the, C, the CDs, uh, usually CDs are guaranteed by the FDIC. What guarantees do we have in Lebanon once the CDs are issued? Tomorrow the bank can devalue the CDs or the central bank. And my other question, uh, Lebanon already is in debt like 140% against its GDP. Now, if we're going to add a debt against the gold, are we digging a deeper hole? The CDs, the CDs are not guaranteed by FDIC. FDIC guarantees your bank deposit up to a certain amount. It, uh, if you have a million dollars in the bank, the FDIC doesn't guarantee you a million dollars. So it's uh, and certainly doesn't guarantee it guarantees your bank CDs if you have CDs up to a certain amount. Um, 250k. 250k, but you know, yeah. so so um, so not all CDs are guaranteed. The um, now the debt of 140 percent. You know, we don't know what that percentage is today because, like I said, the Lebanese government debt in Lebanese pounds now is worth 10 billion dollars. So if your GDP is now 8 billion, then maybe it is still at 100 plus. But if your GDP is at, is at 15 or 20 billion, maybe now you are in much better situation. In 2019, GDP was 51.99 billion. Yeah, but you know, I mean, that is no longer the case, right? Our GDP today is maybe, you know, some people estimate it at 20 billion, at 25 billion. Uh, you know, we don't know what the real GDP is today. Uh, okay. okay, we have a question. Thank you, Thank you Jean-Claude. We have a question from uh, um, Ziad Ghanem. In your opinion, what would be a viable roadmap to restore confidence in our banking system? And more importantly, the whole business model in our country. So the question of confidence, how do you regain, how do you re yes. re-establish confidence? That's why the the step-by-step -step mechanism is so bad. You know, you're losing trust every day. I mean, people are trusting the central bank less and less every day. They're trusting the banks less and less. They're trusting the politicians less and less. I mean, if, if a year and a half ago when we had the crisis, you know, measures were taken immediately to, to deal with it, you know, we would have regained credibility by now. And, and so, yeah, I mean, how do you regain credibility is basically by, by taking the medicine. Just swallowing it and, and swallowing the pill and, and just drastic. Yeah, but not swallowing the pill like the government plan says. The government plans, uh, you know, swallow the pill by the government plan is like you lost your money, go home. No, you know, it's, it's swallowing the pill that, you know, there's going to always be difficulty but you need to manage the difficulty, not manage it with time like this, little by little, but manage it with proper uh, instruments. Like I was saying, the CDs using the gold for liquidity. Um, you know, there's there are other mechanisms there that, uh, unfortunately, I mean, this is not a situation 
where I can share my plan, I'd be happy to, uh, to email it to anybody that it has all the detail in it. Okay, you mentioned, somebody raised the fact that you mentioned there are many ways to deal with governance. Can you please explain what you meant by that? Uh, governance? Of, yes, you said that well, many I mean, what we're saying is, what Gerard Charvet and I are saying in our plan is, uh, we need to take $24 billion worth of the government's assets and put them in a trust, in an international trust. So the government's plan says, put them in a, in a public asset company. We don't trust the politicians to manage these assets. And we certainly don't trust a company mandated by the politicians to manage those assets. We're saying, give them to an international trustee that's outside the purview of Lebanese politicians. And that trustee will have the obligation of managing those assets for a period of up to 10 years. During those 10 years, it has the obligation of, of uh, restructuring them in order for them to be privatizable and privatize them within that period of time. So that within that period of time, you can get the revenue to, um, to pay the CDs that we are talking about. Now, I, I mentioned this and it reminds me, people are saying, you want two things. People are saying you want to take these assets and then you deprive the Lebanese government of a source of income. No, it's not true because the assets that we're taking are revenue neutral. Yeah, the government makes some money on telecoms but loses money on electricity. Uh, the real estate does not produce any revenue. So overall, this trust fund is, is revenue neutral for the government. We're not taking money away from treasury. And the second thing that people say is um, you know, there's been an AUB study recently that has valued these assets at much less than what you're valuing them at. You say you can put $24 billion there, of which $16 billion are state-owned enterprises. And the answer is no. We are valuing those assets at $24 billion at the exchange rate of $1,500. But when the exchange rate is $10,000, you know, those assets are valued at a lot less because our valuation is not a value, is, a, is an accounting valuation, is not a valuation of real value of the companies. We're trying to solve the accounting problem on the bank, on the books of the central bank and the banking system. And so it is a transfer of those assets. At the upside, whatever, up, so that loss is going to be absorbed upfront, but whatever upside there is, is going to be shared by the Lebanese people because that upside in the real, at the time of the privatization, the first portion will go to pay the CDs, and then anything in excess of that will go to the treasury. Ziad, I want to ch jump to a couple of people who raised their hands, and then we'll come back to the question to chat box. Uh, Rania, would you like to uh, to ask your question, please? Rania, are you still there? Uh, Rani, Rani. Rani, Rani, I'm sorry. This is, uh, Rani Al-Raji, okay, I read it, Rania. Sorry, Rani, go ahead. Hello, I'm a uh, class of 94, Jeanville, and I'm also a member of uh, Muatinun Muatinat Fidawla. Uh, a couple of years ago, uh, before the crisis started, we did a campaign about the gold. And uh, we asked uh, several officials uh, about the gold, where, where the whereabouts of the gold are, uh, how much of the gold is still there, and we have no answers whatsoever. So if in your plan, there's, uh, there's the gold involved, uh, it's a big question mark because this is not something that the government is telling us about. We don't know if this gold exists or not and how much is left of it. Thank you. Thank you. Well, I mean, this is subject to what we can go by is what the central bank is telling us. The central bank is telling us it has that gold. Uh, I don't expect any politician to actually know where it is, but somebody at the central bank should know. Some of it is in Fort Knox. Some of it is deposited with Deutsche Bank in Germany. Somebody is, some, you know, some of it is with, you know, BNP in Paris. I mean, it's all, it can be all over the place. Um, obviously, if there's any doubt about that, hopefully the audit would, would, uh, would, would discover that. And that's why it is very important to audit the central bank. I want to give the floor to my good friend, uh, Nicola Shikhani, who is obviously someone who is also very outspoken and very regularly 
on the media giving his own view of the uh, of the crisis and solutions. Nicola, good to have and, you. And, and, no, and knows about this subject as much, if not more, than I do. Inside out, <laughs> exactly. Nicola, <laughs> we'd like to hear your question. Uh, uh, Raja, thank you. Th thank you for... Uh, uh, you hear me? Hello? Yeah, there's echo. There's echo. Why is there echo? Okay, let me let me let me see what I can do. You have two devices on. Hello. You now we hear you. Okay. Go ahead. You hear me? Perfect. Yeah. Much better. Very well. Okay. I'm going to put it on the other side. I'm going to Sorry. This is technology. First, thank you very much, Raja, for inviting me. Uh, Ziad, uh, you know that I love you and I love uh, uh, Gerard. Thank you, the feeling is mutual. Uh, and I really appreciate uh, what you have said and I agree with it 100%. But in one thing I personally don't agree is touching gold. Because uh, gold, is, besides the fact it is, uh, you know, a golden uh, goat or a golden bull yes. or whatever yes. you call it, and beside the fact that uh, uh, our grandfather doesn't want to, to leave the shop for the supermarket, I think gold uh, uh, is at risk if we touch it. It's not about the usability of the gold, it's the risk around the gold uh, for two reasons. First, we don't know if it exists, and the latest uh, audit report of Deloitte uh, 218 on the central bank showed that they couldn't check it. Uh, so Rani is right. But uh, let's assume that it's here, okay? Today, as you know, we have 10 billion or $12 billion of euro bond uh, creditors outside Lebanon who uh, cannot be paid. And today there is no plan to pay them. No one has put a plan to be able to find more than $10 billion maybe, okay? Uh, tomorrow, if we release the gold, from the central bank, which is an entity not governmental today, okay, independent from the government, because the loan uh, on the euro bond is between the government and the outside creditor, Ashmore and Fidelity. I think, I think personally, the gold would be at risk today for having a creditor that puts hands on the gold. This is the first risk. The second is that uh, if we don't solve our balance of payment, if we don't solve our balance of payment, the deficit of, of, of five to six billion today, and if we, if we want to start to do a growth uh, that we are all wishing, uh, maybe the deficit will slightly increase or remain the same, let's say. Uh, uh, we will be using money that we'd have landed against the gold uh, instead of uh, using this liquidity that you are talking about, uh, which is great idea, in fact, uh, to uh, finance the CDs and, and other growth in the country. So for me today, uh, uh, the objective is to try to find a way uh, without touching the gold. Now, I know the gold, uh, tomorrow, if there is a, a, a rating on the country, the gold will, will get into the rating calculation. Let's face it. Uh, if we don't have, if, if people take a loan on the gold and the loan is used uh, to pay the creditor or to pay the balance of payment, we will lose also our gold because we are not sure that our government will be able to do the needed uh, slahat, let's say, reforms, either to cover his, his deficit or to cover the balance of payment. They don't have a plan today and no one has. I want your opinion on that, on the two risks, the creditor and the balance of payment. Thank you very much. So, um, obviously I was talking about only a very small part maybe a billion, $2 billion worth of gold being sold in order to uh, assist with the explosion situation of Beirut. Uh, the plan itself does not call for that gold, whether it is a loan or whether it's sale of gold to be liberated absent many other conditions. So um, it, it assumes that that entire plan is enacted as, as law by the government, by, by parliament, it assumes that it is done in cooperation with the IMF. It assumes that there's a negotiation on the Euro, on the Eurobond uh, haircut that takes place ahead of time. So, so the gold is 
the dealing with the gold is the last piece of the puzzle. It's once you have all these other puzzles taken care of, that's when you actually come with that with that piece uh, on on your checkerboard. Um, definitely, you don't want to take the risk of legal risk of somebody putting their uh, hand on the gold. Uh, you don't want to do that. But again, I mean, you you take all these precautions and, and get assurances of the IMF and other people that you're uh, it's going to be done right. And um, I, I want to mention something here that. I know that many people think that, and maybe maybe politically, for some political reason, having to do with the United States or Iran or something, you know, somebody's going to come and say, okay, you keep your gold and we're going to give you money. And but <laughs> but normally it doesn't happen this way. You know, people are going to say <laughs> why am I going to give you money? You have gold. You know, use your gold. Then I will pay you. Then I will give you if there's something additional. So I, I, I hear your concern. Uh, your concerns are my concerns as well. But I, I think we uh, need to be pragmatic and approach the process. Uh, sort of, uh, you know, not not put any, not put any shvulu uh, khutut hamar, if you like. Red lines. أنا 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 إذا 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 بدك زياد إنه I agree with you على the balance of payment إنه هيدي صعبة شوي نحلها هلا we have we can take a small risk on it but on the creditors أنا I think the risk is huge today if we look what happened in in Argentina where where the 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 vulture funds like Elliot uh, has really blocked you lived in in south america i think uh, central america okay. has blocked really uh, argentina from getting access to the global market uh, we'll have a problem and as soon as they see that there is money somewhere this is the right right it's the right in terms of uh, uh, of uh, first uh, first access to the to the liquidity available to cover their uh, debt so okay. as long as we didn't solve the 10 billion dollar of ashmore i think it anna personally uh, we can argue as much as well. Uh, I think it's- No, no, I'm with you. I'm with you, uh, Nicola, it's, I'm it's with you. I, I agree with you. I agree. I agree with you, definitely. You're right, you're right. Gentlemen, we can listen to you the whole evening about this point and other points. Thank you, Nicola, for raising these. Thank you, Ziad, for the answers. We have to move on a bit for the sake of time. It's, it's almost, we're almost done with time. Uh, one more question. Uh, we do believe that the exchange rate at this stage is linked to any, for political reasons. I think somebody is asking the exchange rate today, the way it is at 10,000, 10,500, almost 11,000 is more political than it is economic, but it's also due to the fact there's complete loss of confidence in the system. Am I, is that the, is that the right answer, uh, Ziad? Absolutely, absolutely. I mean, all, all of these things are, are, I mean, psychology plays a, a more important role in driving the, the price of, of all financial instruments, including currency, than actual, uh, you know, uh, supply and demand do many times. Mm -hmm. Somebody is asking. I hope that Mr. Hayek is advising the government, or are you sitting on any any committees or boards at this time? I think you're happy not to be. No, no. I we tried our best. We Gerard Charve and I went to see every politician. We went to see all the officials in the Lebanese government in Parliament. Um, Everybody says, oh, it's a fantastic plan. We're going to have a meeting next week to with, uh, you know, we're going to invite other people. We're going to discuss it. We never hear from them again. And, and, the, and the media, the only thing the media concentrates on are the gov is the government plan or the bank's plan. Uh, Nicola has written a plan. I mean, it gets an article here or there. We wrote a plan. It, it gets an article here or there. But really, the main media they only talk about these these two failed plans. I mean, I'm I'm so surprised. Well, I'm not surprised. I shouldn't be surprised because, unfortunately, we don't really have very strong uh, economic financial reporting. Uh, so yeah, somebody... I think I think they don't want, and I reached the, the 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 conclusion that they don't want to save the country. Unfortunately, they want to 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 keep it alive until the next election. I think and not get uh, blown up before 
so that they lose the elections. I, 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 yani it's systematic, systemic, uh, non-saving the country, systemically, not systematically. This is uh, aberration. Uh, Ziad Simo is asking, uh, would a currency board help create monetary stability? You don't mention a currency board in your plan, do you? No. You don't um, believe in it, or what, what's your take on that? No, I mean, a currency board is basically a, a very drastic approach. It's basically limiting the liquidity and the, and the, and the uh, purchasing power of the Lebanese to the supply of dollars that, that's available. Um, and uh, I think that, you know, you create a currency board when you're trying to stabilize the currency. But in our case, we're dealing with much more than just the currency stabilization. We're, we're dealing with uh, essential problems that have to do with our banking system, with the debt, with the, uh, with the you know, corruption that exists. I mean, so many problems. It's not, we're not just trying to, to manage the currency uh, valuation. Somebody's asking, why are you advocating for a six month uh, floating exchange rate? Why just let it eventually stabilize by itself? Why are you putting a six month deadline on your, on your proposal? I mean, this, is, this can be argued. Many people have different, different ideas and different approaches. The reason we're saying six months is to, like we said, let the market find the, stability, the stable level of the Lebanese pound. Let the market through supply and demand find the real level, the real value of the Lebanese pound. And after that, implement a crawling peg. And I explained why the crawling peg, because you want to manage, you don't you want to avoid volatility in the exchange rate. Uh, we have a question. But, but the crawling peg, the crawling peg, really continues to reflect the real value of the currency, yes. uh, because the crawling peg mo moves up or down. It's just this is the range that moves up or down within which the central bank will either defend the currency or provide more of it. Well, Han is asking: Does the central bank, in your opinion, have any plans to increase the exchange rate from thirty nine hundred? Bounce to the dollar on the on the official platform to a higher value. Is there any talk of this this uh, three thousand nine hundred going? I don't know. I, I mean, I, I'm sure the subject is discussed all the time. Um, I don't know if if and when they'll make a decision, but I I assume that they will because I mean they implemented thirty nine hundred in the first instance because. Uh, the Lebanese pound, uh, the exchange rate had gone to 5,000 or something. And I think now that it's at 10,000, they will adjust that. Okay. So one last question, and I think this is a very general question. Can you share your plan? I suggest that anybody who would like to have an access, access to Ziad's plan, uh, a, a right to Ziad directly uh, or Hisham, do you want uh, to go through the alumni, ask, ask you to, to provide the plan? Have you done that in the past? I'll, I'll, I can send it to Hisham. He can send it to Okay, uh, very good. We'll do that. Uh, so can please, I have a but, comment? Is there, can I have a just a comment question? Uh, Patrick, is that you? Yes. Yes. Hi, yes. Tadal. Hi. Yeah, uh, like all the plans that are being presented, obviously, it's a very interesting plan, Ziad's plan. Uh, I think they have one point to address is that uh, whether the government uh, will be ready to take some of its assets in order to guarantee anything, you know, regarding saving part of the depositors' uh, money. And what we need to, 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 to remember is that the, the government is still in deficit. It has its own problems. It did not solve yet. So I think that at this stage, uh, whatever assets the government may have, whatever things they can uh, get liquefied, they will use that for their own uh, uh, pressing needs. And the proof for that is after all the haircut that has happened, the, the, the real haircut, because now the central bank has only maybe $17 billion, we're not even able to stop the bleeding. So, so uh, I don't think that it will be easy that the government 
that the government willingly uh, puts its own assets to help banks, to help depositors, even though it is rightful. Uh, you cannot say, you know, forget about your money, you have to deal with it. But if you want to be practical and look at the difficult situation of the government at the budget deficit, which is far from being solved, it is a, a, a long shot. So what do you think, Ziad, of this? I think that, uh, like I said, I mean, this, this basket of uh, assets is, uh, is revenue neutral to the government. So it's not depriving it of any, any income that it now has. Um, so it should not make a difference. Uh, of course, the deficit will still be there, but hopefully the deficit can be, you know, that's, that's, another, that's another can of worms that you need to deal with. Um, but uh, that, they would, that they would use these assets today, they would liquefy them, as you say, or, or liquidate them or sell them in order to create money for to supply, to, to, to help the budget. Uh, I don't think they would do that because today these assets are worth one tenth of what they should be worth. I mean, I think the Lebanese people that are saying don't sell those assets, they belong to us. Uh, you know, if they're not willing for them to be sold seven, eight years from now at the hundred cents on the dollar, they, you know, if the government tries to sell them today at 10 cents on the dollar, it's going to be a political suicide. I don't think, and anyway, I don't think there's a market for them. I don't think, you know, I don't think anybody in their right mind, for example, today would be willing to buy EDL. Maybe they'd buy the telecom, uh, but that's it. I mean, nothing else. And nobody's going to buy the Régie de Tabac, you know, deal, and then deal with, uh, with the political impact of that or whatever. Uh, so I, uh, I, I don't think I, I don't think it's realistic. I think today, actually, all the politicians we spoke to, I, there is not one single politician that we spoke to, uh, and I believe we spoke to everybody, that said they're not willing to part with the assets. Uh, the reason they hesitate and the people that are against parting with the assets are actually the, the people in the Saura that uh, that you know, consider that these assets belong to the people and they don't want the politicians to privatize them. Thank you, Ziad. Well, I think we've reached the end of our questions here, unless there's anybody in the audience who still uh, has any question. Uh, I think this was a very insightful discussion, Ziad. Thank you so much for your views. Uh, glad to see you, you're, you're around and pushing for these views as much as possible uh, and, and not giving up. And uh, uh, thank you, thank you. I mean, our I, agony is uh, is is not forever. Thank you very much. I, I thank everybody for taking, you know, the time of their evening to listen to me. Um, I really appreciate that. You, uh, I mean, I, I'm very very grateful and very humbled. Thank you very much. Thank you. It's afternoon in Montreal, guys. <laughs> Uh, thank you, Hisham, for having this. Thank you. Organize that. And I would like to thank uh, our Shi Shanville alumnus, friends. Thank you, Ziad. Thank you, Raja. It was really great. Uh, inshallah, best to sum the plan. For sure. And hopefully, we'll see you all and come in another, hopefully, uh, interesting subject and webinar very soon. Thank you, guys. Thank you, everybody. Good Take care and see everyone. you soon. Bye -bye. Thank Bye. you all. Thank you. Thank you. Bye.